All right. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen, or morning, or afternoon, or whatever it is, when and where you're at when you watch this. Um, the title of this video is U.S. Plan to Invade Canada, and it's from the Infographic Channel. I've watched some of their military videos in the past, and it's basically, you know, cartoonish, but they usually explain a hypothetical situation and what would happen or would be expected to happen. So let's just get into it. I don't think we're planning on invading Canada, but if we did, this might be how it would play out. Ready for an all-out invasion. The enemy are mounted on horses with red uniforms. These soldiers might not look threatening, but they come from a long line of Mounties uh, who grew up Mounties. in the harsh conditions of the Canadian Arctic. The signal is given. U.S. soldiers flood across the border. The invasion of Canada has begun. <laughs> Surprisingly, not only was there a fully detailed plan for the United States to invade Canada, called the War Plan Red, but it wouldn't even be the first time battles broke out between the two nations. During the period between World War I and World War II, the countries of the world were on edge yeah, seeing that that's one thing i'm actually pretty confident about is the pentagon actually has plans pretty much to invade every country of the world pretty much you know the plans are already laid they're constantly updated by new satellite information new you know intelligence information but the plans i believe probably for every country even uk are probably sitting there somewhere in the Pentagon. At any given moment, another war could break out. Leaders imagined what it'd be like to control more territory or fend off invaders trying to take their country. This led to both the United States and Canada coming up with plans to invade each other. The crazy thing is, you won't believe who planned on invading first. Canada was actually the oh. first of the two countries to develop an invasion oh, plan. After the First World War ended, the United States had shown they had the military power to make a difference in the world. Their technology was advanced. Unlock your full creative potential. Go to fxhome.com now and download the only video. They had relatively large populations of people to enlist when it came to. If you wonder why, why I was looking away, I was actually looking up famous Canadians to see who Canada has given us. Jim Carrey, Celine Dion, Avril Lavigne, I like Avril. Keanu Reeves, and Seth Rogen. Seth Rogen's funny. Alanis Morissette, she chatted her time back in the 90s. Michael J. Fox. Mike Myers, I never even saw that Austin Powers movie. So, um, Pamela Anderson, yeah, she had her time. Anybody else? William Shatner. The Botez sisters. Got about the Botez sisters. I think they were from Canada. Dwayne Johnson, I did not know that. Brian Adams, eh, I thought he was from the UK. Um, Tom Green. Elon Musk, they could have kept that bastard. Tommy Chong, Tommy Chong, cheech like peach, Chong like dong. All right. Uh, it's just a side note. I want to see what they've done for us. And they've, and they've got that food, poutine or something like that. That's supposed to be good, like the gravy on fries. I think it's gravy and cheese on fries. All out war. Like this made Canada nervous as they hadn't always had the best relationship with their neighbor to the south. Canada tasked one of their war heroes named Buster Brown to Buster conduct Brown. reconnaissance along the U.S.-Canadian border to identify main entry points. Brown was happy to help his nation. He put on a disguise and made his way along the nation's shared eastern border. What he found raised the hopes of the Canadian government that defeating Americans would not only be possible, but easier than they thought. Brown traveled around New England in his Ford Model T with a Kodak oh, camera to take pictures. He found that Americans were not all that scary, but instead were something else entirely. During his mission, Brown sent back reports including descriptions like, if Americans are not actually lazy, they have a very deliberate way of working and apparently believe in frequent rests and gossip. He also <laughs> took a shot at American women where he wrote, the women oh, of the Buster rural Brown. districts appear to be a heavy and not very calmly lot. Ah. Basically, in his official reports to the Canadian government concerning the invasion of the United States. Wait, Brown lazy, said American men were lazy and American women were ugly. In 1921, Jeez. using Brown's reconnaissance along with that of other operatives, Canada came up with their invasion plan. They would launch attacks across five different sections of the border to take U.S. cities in the north that had strategic significance. Each city could then be used as a base of operations oh. to move further south. The Canadians would not be able to carry out this plan alone using only Mounties and their military. Instead, they would rely on the help of Britain. Canada uh. gained its independence from Britain in 1867. It's always the Brits. Brits are always trying to start wars with us. They act like we're their friend. 
And they're always trying to start a war. But they still depended on them for military protection. It's interesting to note that Canada's plan to invade the US made it clear they would reclaim Maine as their own, which brings us to the tumultuous relationship that Canada and the United States had in the past. The two countries get along pretty well today, but that wasn't always the case. This tense relationship dates all the way back to the War of 1812, when soldiers from Canada crossed yeah. into the United States. What the, the damn British? It's helping the damn British. Marched on Washington, D.C. and burned our White House. Burned the White House to the ground. This was a bold statement Bastards. by the then British colony that they were not afraid to invade their neighbor and ransack their capital. The War of 1812 ended with no clear victor, as the British were able to defend their western territories but could not claim more land as the forces were split between North America and fending off Napoleon in Europe. Eventually, the British were pushed back to Canada, but the border was now a hotbed for skirmishes and petty disputes between the two powers. It quickly became clear that the Canadians and the Americans were not fans of one another, <laughs> as they would use any crazy excuse to start a fight. For example, in 1838, there was the Lumberjack or Pork and Beans War. It all started over. I think we almost came to war too, also on a, up in Washington, Washington State. The island there in the Strait of Del Fuco or whatever it is there in the Salish Sea. There was an island there. I'm pretty sure it almost started a war between us about that island. Over a Let's silly argument about who could chop down more trees along the border between Maine and New Brunswick, things got out of hand, and the Americans claimed that the Canadian lumberjacks were crossing their border to uh, cut down uh, U.S. trees. Now, this seems like a ridiculous Canadians. reason to start a war, but the United States apparently took their trees very they took our trees. seriously, as they sent 50,000 men to the border Holy to protect shit. their lumber interests from those dubious Canadians. Before the war broke out, Secretary of State Daniel Webster and the British Chancellor of the Exchequer, Baron and Ashburton met for talks. They concluded that the dispute was over a piece of land that really wasn't worth anything, and Canada ended up relinquishing control over its section of Maine to the United States. Uh. But the peace wouldn't last long between the two countries, as 20 years later, an altercation involving a pig being shot and the disproportional response yeah, of naval fleets almost led to another war between the two countries. In 1859, an American yeah. farmer found a pig eating potatoes on the San Juan Islands <laughs> just off the coast of the Northwestern Territory of the United States. This area would eventually become part of Washington state. Americans decided they didn't want that pig eating all their potatoes, Damn, pig, so they pig, shot the it. Whether they knew it was a Canadian pig or not <laughs> can be debated. However, the Canadians claimed the death of their pig was an act of war. <laughs> this prompted both sides to send naval vessels to confront one another in a showdown that would become known as the Pig War. The United States sent the USS Massachusetts and 500 troops to the area. In turn, the governor of Vancouver responded by sending five warships what? and 2,000 British troops. Luckily, before any blood was shit, I was learning about the pig war. I first knew I wanted to be a pilot at a very young shit. Royal Navy Rear Admiral Robert Baines realized how ridiculous this whole thing was and called off the attack. Baines had decided to engage two great nations in a war over a squabble about a pig would be foolish. However, it wasn't foolish enough for both sides not to leave 100 troops on the island <laughs> to make sure no more funny business regarding the pigs happened until the official borders could be drawn up. War Plan Red was just on the horizon, but the United States may have been thinking about invading Canada long before those plans were ever drawn should, up. We During the Civil War in the United States, two Confederate diplomats tried to flee to I mean, really, like 80% of Canada's population lived within, I think, 200 miles of the border or something like that. And they've got a lot of good natural resources. We really should give some serious thought to just going ahead and making them few extra states. Let's get to 60 states. We'll cut Canada up into 10 states and add them. Then that connects us to Alaska. It fixes a lot of stuff. Canada on board a British ship called... I think it'd make us larger than Soviet Union then. I'm not sure. I'll have to look that up. Be pretty close in size to the Soviet Union and land area. The Trent. The British claimed the U.S. had no right to search their ships or seize anyone on board since they were not officially taking sides in the war. The Governor General of Canada then sent troops to the border in case war broke out between Britain and the U.S. The British and the Canadians were sure that the U.S. Secretary of State was trying to use the whole dispute as a reason to invade Canada, and they would have none of it. Lincoln realized that there would be no way to defend his northern border from the British while simultaneously fighting a war with the 
south, so he decided to let the Confederate soldiers go and sent the British ship that they were aboard on its way. This averted a war with Canada once again, but would the peace last? This brings us to the United States' plan to invade their neighbor to the north. By the time War Plan Red was conceived, there had been relative peace between the two countries for almost half a century, but the world had just come out of the chaos that was World War I, and the US knew anything could happen. Military leaders came up with the plans on how to defend the country if Canada decided to invade. However, they also tossed around the idea of claiming the Canadian territory for themselves as well. It wasn't so I also remember a couple years ago somebody did um they crossed over the border into Canada with an American flag, and I think they planted the flag on the grounds of the parliamentary building and declared that the United States had conquered Canada. I think it was like a publicity stunt or a joke or a comedian or something like that. But I remember somebody planting the U.S. flag there at the parliamentary building and declaring the annexation of Canada so much that the United States wanted to attack Canada for its territory, but it was seen as a way to weaken the British Empire as a whole. Yeah. Everyone at this point was afraid of another nation gaining too much power and using it to take over the world. After they the First World Brits. War, Britain was deeply in debt to the United States. Of they had provided resources, men, and money to help defeat Germany. The US wanted their loans paid back in yep. full, which the British could not do at the moment. This got US military leaders thinking that instead of paying back the money <laughs> they owed, Britain might decide to wage war on the United states using Canada. The best way to stop this from happening would be for the US to invade Canada first, thus removing Britain's foothold on the continent. As a result, War Plan Red was born. One of the craziest things about War Plan Red was that without knowing anything about Canada's plan to invade the US, the military strategists came up with a mirror image oh, of what wow. Canada had already created. The plan called for all invasion forces to proceed simultaneously to ensure that the Canadian defenses were spread thin. The United States outnumbered the Canadians in every way, but there was someone else they had to worry about. About. In order for the invasion of Canada to be successful, the United States needed to make sure that Britain couldn't interfere. To do this, it was imperative that the cities along the Atlantic coast of Canada were secure. This would be done by launching a naval fleet from Boston yeah. to Halifax, that along with an sense. invasion force crossing through Maine. The plan was for U.S. forces to occupy Nova Scotia and New Brunswick before the Canadians knew it hit them. The key was to take Halifax first and to hold it, as this would be the main port the British would use to resupply Canadian forces. The US US would set up a naval blockade around the ports of Halifax, but also keep any ships from reaching the rest of Nova Scotia or the mainland of Canada as well. The only way that Canada could receive the supplies and support they needed was by ship, and if the US could stop the Royal Navy, then Canada would be theirs for the taking. The United States would also need to get boots on the ground in the area as well. Traveling through Maine's dense forests and windy, unkempt roads would be slow and tedious. Therefore, the plan was to load up ships with soldiers and then drop them in St. Margaret's Bay, an undeveloped landing site near Halifax. Halifax, where very oh. little resistance would be encountered. Then the soldiers could circle around and attack the city while the naval vessels were bombarding it from the bay. If all went according <laughs> to the plan, one of the first Canadian cities to be occupied by the United States would be Halifax. If the US failed to do this, Canada would be able to receive supplies from Britain, and a war with their northern neighbor could end up being long and I've heard it's a pretty decent city. I'd take Halifax. Drawn out. However, there was a backup plan if things in Halifax. Oh, I'm gonna have to get my damn. Are you still wearing Merchant. enough layers to insulate no, Alaska? That's why you need the new and yeah, improved bear script. Halifax did not go according to plan. The U.S. could also occupy New Brunswick Under and cut off Nova Scotia from the mainland completely by holding the railway junction at Moncton. By blocking the rail system, supplies could not be moved from Nova Scotia to the rest of Canada. This would have helped with the rest of the invasion effort. However, Nova Scotia would be much harder to take in the long run. In this scenario, there would be an island stronghold that the United States would have to deal with at the end of the war. The other problem was that yeah. from Nova Scotia, the Canadians and British could launch counterattacks down the east coast of the U.S. While the east coast of Canada was being secured, a separate force needed to take larger cities in Quebec and along the St. Lawrence River. This would be done using ground forces, including armed armored divisions of tanks from Albany and Vermont. The occupation of Montreal and Quebec City would be vital to operations. These cities could be used to manufacture weapons and supply Canadian forces if left untouched. The ground forces would likely- I did not realize that Montreal and Quebec City were that close together. This is a- Quebec's way over in the middle of Canada. The Providence, or whatever they call it, of Quebec, isn't it way over in the middle?
I don't know. I don't know. meet only Canadian slight resistance on the way up to the cities, but once there, U.S. forces would encounter enemy soldiers entrenched at entry points to the cities and within buildings. This would bring the battle into the yeah, realm of urban. In the middle. Let me look that up real quick. Let me look that up. Canadian provinces. No, that's that's Saskatchewan. Now, Alberta. Oh, Quebec is that one over there on the east. Huh. Well, who knew that? Probably every Canadian. Warfare, making it extremely costly for the United States. If they didn't take Montreal and Quebec City, however, there would be a chance that they could lose the entire eastern section of Canada. This was especially true if supplies were allowed to travel from the coast to the cities. What made this section of Canada so essential to control was that it would allow the United States to stop the movement of supplies from one side of the country to the other. This would split Canada in two, making it easier for the United States to deal with each half. If the Canadians and British couldn't move supplies and men to areas where the U.S. was attacking, every battle would be easier to win. It would be more important to stop supplies from moving east to west than vice versa, as most of the British troops and materials would be landing on the Atlantic side of the continent. If the country's western half could be separated from the eastern half, the United States could slowly bleed each section dry of resources. Eventually, the Canadians would have to give up and surrender to the American forces. The other important reason behind the United States wanting to occupy Montreal and Quebec City so quickly was because these cities sit on the St. Lawrence River, which could be used as a supply line for the Canadian Canadian and British militaries. If the United States controlled both those cities, they could stop all movement up and down the St. Lawrence and cut off another transportation route. On top of controlling the main river in the region, War Plan Red also called for the United States to control the Great Lakes region and the cities on the Canadian side of these bodies of water. The United States could attack Toronto and other manufacturing centers oh, by deploying yeah, ships Toronto. into the Great Lakes. This would need to be done during either. the initial That's invasion to protect city. the United States from counterattacks. Many of the manufacturing cold, centers in the United States were based in the yeah, Midwest or around the Great Lakes. Cities like Detroit, Chicago, and Buffalo would be easy targets for the Canadians. At yeah, the we ought to just take this. I don't care about Ottawa. Just take this whole peninsula here. And then we'll get Toronto. Yeah. Yeah, we ought to go ahead and do that. Call that the 51st state. We'll even name it Toronto in this honor the U.S. didn't secure the cities around the region. One key component to the invasion across the Great Lakes was to hit Canada's Niagara Falls power grid. Yeah. This would shut down most of the area's power supply, allowing the U.S. forces to fly under the radar, so to speak. It would also slow or stop the production lines of any Canadian factories that relied on electricity to operate. This would be detrimental to the Canadian war machine, as help from Britain would still be a long way off, and the Canadians would have limited means of replenishing their supply of ammunition and weapons in the region. Also, by controlling Controlling both sides of the Great Lakes, the United States would have complete control over the waterways extending out from the yes. area. It would also prevent British ships and aircraft from landing or traveling in the lakes themselves. Basically, it would create a monopoly for the U.S., who would then control the vast water resources in the middle of the continent. Although Winnipeg might not seem like a vital city for the Americans to take, nothing could be further from the truth. This unassuming city was actually the main depot for the Canadian railroad oh. system running from coast to coast. If the United States could capture Winnipeg right and the surrounding there, area, Dakota. They would cripple Canada's ability to move troops from one section of the country to the other. Take the best part 29. about launching an invasion from Grand Forks, North Dakota, to capture Winnipeg was that there were no obstacles in the way. The yeah. ground forces could travel straight north and would encounter very little resistance. They would have to pass through some rough terrain, but overall, the United States saw the capture of Winnipeg Cold as one of the hell. easier aspects of War Plan Red. Now, there was one final part of War Plan Red that needed to be executed with precision if the United States was going to successfully take Canada. Man Vancouver is about as far as you can get from Britain oh, in yeah, Canada. However, it also housed Seattle. the naval base that Britain used for its Pacific fleet. This meant that it would not be an easy target. Vancouver is supposed to be really one of the coolest cities there is. I have not been able to go there yet, but I have heard Seattle's my favorite city. Seattle by far is my favorite city in the world, but I have heard that Vancouver is like Seattle's little sister. Vancouver and Portland. Portland's Seattle's little brother in Vancouver, Seattle's little sister. 
to capture and hold, especially by sea. The plan was to attack from Bellingham, Washington, to try and seize the yeah. city and base That's without right having to risk Seattle. a naval battle. However, if this couldn't be done or additional support was needed, the United States planned to launch ships from Port Angeles. If the US could plan it right, they would wait for either the British Pacific Fleet to be docked with little hope of disembarking before beginning their attack, or when the majority of the fleet was on the other side of the ocean. The hope yeah. was, in this second scenario, that the ships would be so far away that they wouldn't be able to return in time to help fight off the Americans. Either tactic could work but if the United States tried to strike while the fleet was nearby, it could be a disaster. All the U.S. really needed to do was take the city and its port, then they could shut down the railways and set up a naval blockade. This yeah. would pretty much secure Vancouver, even if British reinforcements from the Pacific were sent back to help. If the United States could get a foothold in Vancouver, it would be very difficult for the Canadians and the British to retake the city. There were several main components of Warplane Red that needed to occur outside of Canadian borders as well. During the extensive war games that were conducted at the United States Naval War College, it became clear that the U.S. Navy should not be sent to destroy the British fleet either in the Pacific or the Atlantic Oceans. Instead, all naval vessels would be used in blockades to stop the movement of supplies and troops between Britain and Canada. The Royal Navy was an admirable force to be reckoned with, and the creators of Warplan Red were unsure if the United States Navy would be able to defeat them in open waters. However, by staying close to land and making sure Allied forces were at their backs, the U.S. Navy could focus on repelling any ships that tried to reach Canada through their blockade. When looking at Warplan Red, it's important to remember that all of the invasion forces that were sent by land would likely be successful in taking their targets. In fact, they probably would meet very little resistance at all, and the U.S. soldiers would Big news, the top layer got wiped out. How uh, tragic, got wiped out. literally has sweep across the border and take their targets quickly without many casualties. The reason for this was that compared to the United States military, Canada really didn't have much to fight with. They were supposed to have the support of Britain, but their former rulers were really far away, and it wasn't really clear whether Britain would even bother trying to send troops to fight off an American invasion. Instead, it would have been more likely that Britain would have given up Canada in exchange for some kind of peace treaty or agreement between them and the US. The only viable tactical option for British and Canadian forces what a friend, what a friend Britain would have been, what a friend would be holding Nova Scotia and launching counterattacks from the island. However, it would have been highly unlikely they'd be able to control the island for very long, especially once the United States captured the rest of Canada. The U.S. also had a sneaky suspicion that they could gain an ally from one of the provinces in Canada to help them fight against the British if they approached them in the right way. Quebec is a mostly French-speaking <laughs> province that identifies more as their own entity than as a part of the rest of Canada. Most people in Quebec felt no strong allegiance to the British Empire or their English... Yeah, correct me if I'm wrong, I think there's been several votes over the years for Quebec wanting to succeed from Canada and become their own country. I think they've had several referendums on it speaking countrymen for that matter. It was a real possibility that once the United States began their attack, the leaders of the Quebec province might have tried to make a deal and ally themselves with the U.S. in exchange for maintaining their independence when the war was over. This offer would have likely been accepted by the United States as it would provide their invading forces easy access to several other parts of Canada. They also wouldn't have to fight for control over Montreal and Quebec City, which would save a lot of time, effort, and resources that could be used to ensure that Nova Scotia and Vancouver were taken quickly and blockades were set up to fend off the British Royal Navy. More likely than not, some Canadians would have welcomed the U.S. as liberating them from the British, while others would have fought to the bitter end. Either way, the end goal for the War Plan Red was to claim all the Canadian territories and make them a part of the United States. There was no plan of how the different parts of Canada would be split up, but eventually they would have been reorganized into different states. Yep. The main goal for War Plan Red was, was plan. to destabilize the British colonies in the Americas and the Western Hemisphere. The United States really didn't want to invade Canada, but with the way the world was shaping up after World War or one, they needed to plan for every possibility. If you weren't the most powerful country in your region, there was a chance that your neighbor might see you as an easy target and take what they wanted. Regardless of how Canada was split up, Quebec would have likely been able to maintain its independence if they allied themselves with the United States during the invasion. But the new Quebecois country would have been heavily reliant on its now enormous neighbor as it would be surrounded on all sides oh, by the yeah. US. They also probably would not be able to do anything without the permission of their liberators. As the US military developed War Plan Red, they had scouts and agents assess different paths and ways to invade Canada. Interestingly, it was concluded that the Mounties should not be underestimated, especially we had our own Buster Browns or whatever that guy 
last name was. In their own forest. Did we call them? I'm hoping we called them fat and lazy and ugly too. Did in mountainous terrain. These Canadian soldiers could have developed a type of guerrilla warfare that would make them a problematic force to fight against once the invasion began. Even still, it was concluded that a we U.S. invasion of Canada ugly. had a high likelihood of success. In order to prepare and improve their chances, it was recommended that the United States needed more airfields closer to the Canadian border. In 1935, Congress passed a bill that allocated $57 million for different assets that would improve the U.S. infrastructure while also aiding in the plan to invade <laughs> Canada if it ever came to that. This included the building of three airports near the border which were claimed to be civilian in nature. However, information accidentally leaked to the press that they were in fact military airfields. This led to questions being asked and the first inclinations that the United States had developed a plan to invade Canada to surface. War Plan Red actually led to one of the largest war games in U.S. history when 36,000 soldiers were deployed to Fort Drum to run drills associated with the invasion wow. of Canada. The crazy part was that the military base was only 30 miles from the actual border. If the Canadians had been aware that the war games were happening, they might have contacted their British allies and started preparing for war. Now watch Hitler's actual plan. All right. Well, that ain't quite, isn't quite what I was expecting it to be. Um, I was thinking it was going to be more modern scenario, not right after World War One. But I guess the same in tactics would be employed, you know, as far as where we would invade at and what the key objectives would be. Key objectives would still be Nova Scotia and Vancouver to shut off those seaports and also take out Winnipeg and get control of Toronto and the St. Lawrence River as soon as possible. So, you know, I don't think if we invaded Canada now, we would conduct an air war that much. I think we would just eliminate their air force so they did not pose a threat. But we wouldn't want to devastate their cities. We want that would not want to devastate Toronto or Vancouver no more than was necessary. Just let the ground forces handle it. And it would probably be pretty quick. Well, that was pretty interesting. That was pretty interesting. And with that, I show how it today.